uh hello uh thank you for coming on uh our first guest uh for the student chaplaincy uh, it's really uh an honor to have you on uh for the viewers on the part of the chaplaincy uh this is professor uh, donald Carveff, who is a psychoanalyst who has a lot of videos on youtube and he is uh, a emeritus professor of sociology and social and political thought at york university uh, and a registered psychotherapist um, and, and a famed, on my account, uh, psychoanalyst who has really written a lot about uh, Christianity and a Christian interpretation of, uh, you could say, psychology. Um, so, yeah, uh, perhaps you can say a bit more about, about that. Sure. Um... Well, I, I was raised as uh, an Anglican, Episcopal, um, lost it all at about age 12. Uh, it all came back in my 40s. And uh, I had always been reading a liberal Protestant theology. Uh, for a long time, I was reading it only with an intellectual connection to it, but no heart connection. But in my 40s, um, and when I watched my father die, it happened to be in a Catholic hospital and there was a crucifix on the wall right above his bed. And that started something. And then suddenly I found myself a father <laughs> and uh, all of these things uh, sent me back to church. And um, I, so uh, for many years, I've been struggling to reconcile uh, because for many years before the return i was an ardent atheist uh friedrich nietzsche karl marx sigmund freud john paul sartre um, and yet very strongly attracted to christianity and impressed by the great christian theologians uh, reinhold niebuhr the nature and destiny of man you know paul tillich um, um, Bultmann, um, all of these, Bonhoeffer, all of these people. Um, so I was struggling, I've been struggling a long time to try to reconcile these things one way or another, sort of shifting positions. Um, and I guess I'm still struggling to some extent. Um, I was asked to deliver a paper this March to the Western New England Psychoanalytic Institute at, uh, at Yale. And uh, the paper is called On the Essential Spirituality of Psychoanalysis. But that opens up so many questions. What do people mean by spirituality? People say, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. And what are we supposed to know about? What, what, what do we think about that? Are they worshiping crystals? pyramids themselves <laughs> uh, and the word spirit and the word soul um Bettelheim wrote a whole book in the 80s about freud and man's soul you know and he said that if you had if the english-speaking world had had proper translations from the german we would have known that psychoanalysis um, is a soul making enterprise and and that psychoanalysis is soul study and psychoanalysts should be called soul doctors now i mean he was splitting and projecting he was he was idealizing the humanist side of freud's work and projecting the reductionist positivism onto james Strachey's translations <clears throat> but at least he reminded the english-speaking world that psyche refers to soul and spirit not just to mind and um, i like this idea of psychoanalysis as soul making i believe that's what it is um, so these are the issues i'm i'm struggling with um you know i i, I still have a, a a profound um, resistance to anything supernatural um, and yet 
in moments of crisis, I clearly resort to something like the supernatural. I, I try to get at this with, uh, you know, all of the work by Ian McGilchrist on the divided brain and the whole idea that we in the West are a left hemisphere dominated culture, dominated by reason and rationality and out of touch with the right hemisphere where the poetry is and where the faith is. But when I'm going for surgery, I'm praying. And, um, and, and I think if you ask me what happens at death, I seem to be pretty confident that I'm going into the loving arms of Jesus. Now, I don't believe this with my head, not at all, but I feel it in my heart. Therefore, I don't feel terribly afraid of dying. I had my 80th birthday a month ago and, and I'm, I'm a cancer survivor and, uh, I have three stents in my heart. I could go anytime. I could live another 15 years. I'm still writing and I hope to live another 10 or 15 years. Um, but I'm not terribly afraid of death. I'd like to put it off. <laughs> um, but a part of me feels. So there's a split between my thinking and my feeling. My thinking is a Western educated enlightenment rationalist scientifically oriented man i like i, I i'm a little bit of i'm going to stay anglo-catholic but i'm a little attracted to eastern orthodoxy um th they say that faith and doubt go hand in hand there can't be faith without doubt and they don't bother too much about the god stuff um, they're more about get on and do the good work. Um, and I'm very much about ethics. I mean, my whole approach to psychoanalysis, well, I've recently fallen in love with the work of Emmanuel Levinas. He says, ethics is first philosophy. It used to be metaphysics was first philosophy, and then epistemology, whatever. Ethics drew up in the rear, you know, but he says, ethics is first philosophy. And um, my, my approach to psychoanalysis is heavily ethical. It's all about recovering conscience and developing conscience. And to me, you know, living a life of conscience, struggling to be a good person. Um, and my ethics are Christian ethics. To me, that's more important than metaphysical questions about God. Um, and it's a struggle. It's a daily struggle. And, and personally, uh, for me, Jesus is a part of the struggle uh, because he, for he, my moral compass is, is associated with my image of Jesus. Um, Frankly, I don't much care whether he ever really walked the earth or not. Uh, we have the texts of the New Testament. We have the story. And the story contains deep wisdom. And, um, and so I read the New Testament and I'm inspired by it. Um, but the ethics is very, very central to me. Although I can't say my Christianity is reduced to the ethical, because as I say, in moments of crisis, I'm praying and um, I'm, look, I'm feeling loved. I'm feeling uh, totally seen. You know, Anglicans pray, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. I feel that, that I'm perceived thoroughly, all my sins, and I'm still loved. And so at death, I will go into the arms of this loving being. Now, I could say all of that in Kleinian theory. I could say I seem to have internalized a good object. I've recently revised my view of my mother. When I was about four or five, my mother started to become alcoholic. And my whole childhood was plagued and darkened. 
by her alcoholism. And I couldn't stand the ambivalence of both loving her and hating her. So I just hated her. And I repressed the loving mother. But it's clear that she did a very good loving job during the first four years before the alcoholism hit. And I internalized her as a loving good object. So whether I'm going into the arms of Jesus or the arms of my mother, from a psychodynamic point of view, it doesn't really much matter um, who you name the good object. I have the good object inside me and it requires me to be good and it makes me feel loved and it makes me feel required to give love back. Okay, there, what did that take, five minutes? That's a complete statement of where I'm at. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that complete statement and uh, congrats on your birthday. I think we all thank hope you. that you stay along for uh, longer indeed. Uh, and I think thank also it might be interesting for your audience to know that I myself have been, uh, I discovered your YouTube videos uh, six years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was just really eye opening uh, in terms of what you had been saying in those videos about. Uh, Maybe we can get into it a bit more later, but it was just at that moment it was like, wow, yeah. this is, I've never seen anything like this before. So the I'm so glad the of doing, I think, is is revealed in also these videos that you've made. Did, did you say the Eastern Orthodoxy? Uh, uh, your last sentence, could you say it again? I didn't quite get yeah. it. You mentioned the Eastern Orthodoxy of more, more uh, concerned with doing. Uh, yes. And I, I think that is also shown or revealed through your own ethic of making these uh, videos. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I have to say, uh, at the time, it was, I think it also has to do with a kind of a post-secular paradigm, which I think your work fits really uh, well into. Uh, where you said, post hey. Post-secular, post-secular. That's a term I haven't heard much post-secular in the netherlands it's uh i do a master in uh spiritual care okay uh, at the view in amsterdam and there like that's a topic or a term that's been uh used where like there's it. an introduction of the good in terms of organizing city life and uh other areas where uh the boundaries between what is would previously be considered secular uh, versus religious, those boundaries uh, slipping a bit. Okay. Uh, and there's a very famous person who coined it. Is it Habermas? I think it's Habermas who coined it. Oh, it's Jürgen Habermas. Yeah. Ah, hmm. Interesting. And and yeah, I consider your uh, to have like a kind of Carvethian challenge to the uh, atheist versus. Christian or otherwise religious paradigm using your Kleinian uh, interpretation of there's fundamentalist thinking and fundamentalist spirituality, and there's mature or ambivalent uh, type of spirituality. Uh, Which echoes Klein's uh, paradigm yeah. schizoid versus depressive reparative position. Right now I'm teaching a course at my institute on fantasy, spelt with a PH, unconscious fantasy. And uh, next week I'm teaching two papers by Hannah Siegel. And um, her big distinction is between what she calls symbolic equation, which is the concrete, the dead metaphor, the literal, versus what she calls symbolic representation, which is metaphor that is appreciated as metaphor, that is a live metaphor. And that's very much the distinction you're addressing. Yeah, and, and you can be a fundamentalist atheist as much as you can be a fundamentalist Christian. Absolutely. So, uh, you can sort of say, oh, I'm an atheist, but if you now have this all-knowing, all-powerful God that you could make science to be, for instance, then you are just as much as religious as the, like your, then your position of atheism is not atheistic enough. And your atheism requires you to <laughs> develop a, an ethic that leads you into the direction of the good, which is how you, uh, I consider, I, uh, 
caught from your last uh, podcast is how basically you define spirituality and the divine and Freud himself more or less revealed that he was religious atheist in that way. In the future of an illusion, he he's you know he says science is no illusion, and he says all of these things about <laughs> things that science really is not and cannot deliver. But but he had a real faith in science for sure. Rationalist. Um, I've also been critical of Wilfred Bion, um, who also to me seems too uh, rationalist. The way I got to that was through that, I think there's a video uh, applying Bion to the study of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. And there are the two rationalist heroes, Ralph, who was the captain of the boys' uh, cadet corps, and Piggy, and they're rational. Piggy knows how to use his strong glasses to make fire, and he knows that there are certain um, things that can be eaten and other things, berries that are poisonous and so on. And, and they know to set the fire on the hill to try to get rescued. And they're there. But there's a third hero, Simon. And Simon is not a rationalist. Uh, he, he is loving and healing and uh and and he discovers the good news they thought there was a monster on the island and he realizes that there isn't and he comes to bring the good news that there is no monster and he's slain on the beach so it's a christ metaphor um so in terms of beyond beyond doesn't get the third hero he gets the rational but he doesn't emphasize in Bionian theory, there is not enough emphasis on, on, on love. Yeah. And then you also wind us back into your interpretation of uh, this spiritual interpretation, you could say into the importance of having this in practice of psychology or psychoanalysis, this concept of the good, the concept of conscience. Yes, yes. Well, that's what I've been pushing for, for 20 years. It seems to be catching on. Um, you know, I get I get many more invitations to speak in the in the US. Well, and in the UK. Um, more than I get in Canada, but you know, a prophet is never recognized in his own land. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I get invited to speak in New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, San Diego, uh, wherever. They they seem to be liking and seeing the need for a revival of conscience as a separate function. Um, and of course, I'm tying conscience right into the the true self. So. Uh, and that ties into the idea of soul making. I mean, to recover or develop a conscience is soul making. And um, I really like the concept of the soul because the soul can be sickened. The soul can be corrupted. The soul can be lost. Um, um, and this is all connected to ethics. I mean, on, on, on an unethical life is a soul destroying life uh, so yeah it's uh that's that's the work and it seems to be it seems but the thing is there there have been some recent psychoanalysts who write about soul making um um a british analyst who is actually the stepdaughter of uh donald Meltzer she wrote a book called the veil of soul making and Meltzer writes a preface to it and he says you know uh, psychoanalysis now acknowledges its roots in in poetry and and joins the arts because for for her meg harris william uh, williams yeah um the, the the roots of the soul she's 
a literary scholar, she finds this in Wordsworth, Coleridge, uh, Blake, Yeats, and I'm sure this is all valuable. I mean, this is all valuable. But to say that psychoanalysis now joins the arts, um, this is disturbing to me. Uh, I just find it very interesting that psychoanalysts find it easier to associate themselves with medicine, with neuroscience, now with the arts, even with mindfulness meditation, kind of a quasi-Buddhist. So that's medicine, neuroscience, the arts, meditation, but never with ethics. From the beginning, psychoanalysts have repressed their identity and, and have, have been lying about the true nature of psychoanalysis, which is an ethical enterprise from the start to the finish. I, I always say we, we, we are a value infused, not a value neutral science and practice. And we value love over hate and life over death and truth over lies. But we lie about this. And we, we, we say, look, we're not about, we're about helping people move towards mental health. I say, no, we're about helping people move towards salvation. <laughs> but they will never talk this way, you know. Uh, we, we will never admit that we're out to convert people. I don't mean to Christianity, I mean converting them from paranoid schizoid position to depressive reparative position. And that is a conversion, it's a very slow one. It's not like St. Paul, not like Paul on the road to Damascus, Saul, I should say, on the road to Damascus, and then becomes Paul. Now that's dramatic, we don't do the dramatic conversion, but it's a very slow conversion, it requires a lot of patience, but it's still a conversion. Yeah, and you uh, touched there on the, the topic of guilt, on the, the distinction between what you describe as uh, persecutory guilt on the one hand, on the other hand, reparative guilt. Yeah. And the importance of where the persecutory guilt belongs to this schizoid paranoid position of splitting, everything's all good or bad, yeah. and you're harshly criticizing yourself and the reparative position is uh, related to conscience and and uh, seeing, hey, if I punish myself or others, that doesn't really help anyone. Exactly. So there needs to be some effort to repair. Yes. And I realized like uh, this reparative guilt that you're talking about, like really does it also just amount to uh, forgiveness? Yes. Yes. Um, when we move into the reparative position, I always think of conscience as like my metaphor for conscience is the father of the prodigal son. His son's been off whoring and gambling and comes crawling back broke, and the father is so delighted that his son is back. He says, Kill the fatted calf, we're having a party. Your brother is home. You know, now many ways to relate. You can talk about the resentment of the older brothers who stayed home and worked while a younger brother was off. Um, but the father, uh, I, what most interests me is that the father is forgiving. His boy is home. You know, that's such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful story. I think conscience is like that. Um, conscience has a bite. Um, I'm not saying it's some neutral you know, anything goes. No, conscience has a bite and you don't feel good when you are out of sync with your conscience. You're not sleeping well. Um, you're not walking around with a lot of self-respect, um, which makes you very vulnerable to attack. You can't defend yourself properly against bad people because you feel you're bad yourself right it's like you've got one or both hands tied behind your back um and conscience is persistent it it doesn't let go it will keep fighting at you um but 
It doesn't want to humiliate you. It doesn't want to scourge you. It wants you to turn around and come back and get on the right path. And if you do, it welcomes you wholeheartedly and forgives everything. And um, so very different from the hostile superego. And of course, what I personally have discovered in my private life and with patients is that ultimately turning to conscience and and aligning yourself living according to your conscience is the only ultimately it's the only way to escape the savage persecuting superego because if you are out of sync with conscience your superego can have you for breakfast you can't defend yourself against the superego and it's whipping you because it's a sadistic agency it's pseudo moral it speaks the language of morality but what it's really interested in is beating you uh, if you're in in sync with conscience back off you can say to the superego and and it it backs off it can't get at you if you know yourself that you are striving I, i'm not going to say if you know you're good because we're not we're fallen we're broken we're, we're there, there's always something wrong we're always falling short but if you know that you are seriously striving to be good seriously striving to overcome your sinfulness as a struggle every day superego cannot whip you um so that's this is so clinically important i mean we're we're, we're trying to help people um this the, the, the sadistic superego is at the root of every form of psychopathology psychosis neurosis borderline doesn't matter takes a different form in different um, conditions but ultimately the sadistic superego is at work and therefore people are self-defeating and self-harming and addicted and whatever uh, how do we help them well they have to make this turn towards conscience um, Nothing else is going to really solve the problem. And then how would you uh, recommend for people to find conscious or to navigate towards? Well, uh, pretty in a pretty traditionally psychoanalytic way, I work very much with dreams. Um, because dreams are messages from the soul. And the dreams are saying things are not right in the state of Denmark. Uh, there's something rotten in the way you're living. Um, and in coded form, it's calling your attention to uh, the truth. Um, and the truth is very unwelcome so the dreams are heavily disguised but even though the even though they're heavily disguised if if you can bring the patient into a working relationship with you you can help them gradually decode their dreams and after all the these are messages to the patient not from me these are messages to the patient from himself or herself because there's something inside the patient that is trying to rescue him uh, so we just have to help the patient see understand the the voices the messages from within and dream work is central to that but it's not the only way i mean there are many ways that we analyze the slips of the tongue and the symptomatic behaviors and the patient's transference to us uh, or their transference to other people in their lives, bosses, parents. Um, so it's traditional psychoanalysis that I do. But I find that um, when we make progress, uh, well, a friend of mine in Philadelphia, Elio Frateroli, wrote a, a book with wonderful title healing the soul in the age of the brain subtitle becoming conscious in an unconscious world 
that was a beautiful title and it was a, it's a, a great book um about 2000 i guess that came out then then in 2013 he wrote a wonderful essay called the absence of morality in psychoanalytic theory and therapy like me he's a critic of this absence um so healing the soul um I, Elio works like a traditional psychoanalyst, uh, as do I. Um, we're trying to help the patient become conscious. And, and his soul is trying to help us. The superego is trying to oppose us. The superego wants the therapy to break down. The superego is urging the patient to leave the treatment. Um, because the superego knows that if this guy continues to hang out with Carveth, the superego is doomed. <laughs> We're going to get the tyrant and dethrone <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, what I found so interesting as well, you mentioned also uh, becoming conscious. Uh, uh, and you briefly also mentioned meditation and mindfulness. Uh, and I think in an article, you mentioned the importance of uh, introducing the heart in or uh, preceding mindfulness with the heart. So having this sense of goodness and then looking at sort of all the material, because, because if you don't have the heart there, it's simply going to be too difficult to, uh, the super ego is going to have too much sway on you to really be able to become conscious. Yes. Yeah, consciousness, um, you're right, that, that, that mindfulness meditation, I'm a little bit ambivalent about, I'm sure it's a good thing, but um, I think that analysis has always been a form of meditation. Um, I'm, I'm very influenced here by Bion and by Thomas Ogden, and they emphasize the importance of reverie. Why do we not want to do therapy over Zoom? Like I, if I get a new patient, I will talk to them once on Zoom. Um, of course, I'm half blind anyway, so I, I, I can't even, I, I see the world through a mist. Patient, there's no point in having the patient in the chair because I can't see him. Anyway, he might as well lie down on the couch, but I was putting everyone on the couch long before my eyes went down. Um, but, the, uh, Ogden is very clear on this. this a truly psychoanalytic, as opposed to a merely psychotherapeutic. This is the difference between analysis and therapy. Psychoanalysis is different. It's taken me decades to understand this. Um, but the essence is reverie. You see, when the patient is looking at me, I can't go into reverie. Uh, when I'm looking at the patient, the patient can't go into reverie. We're doing what Irving Goffman, the sociologist, called face work. We're being looked at. And that gives us a kind of self-consciousness which distracts us from going into reverie. When the patient lies down, he's free. I'm not looking at his face. I'm free. He's not looking at my face. So after one session on zoom i ask patients to go to the telephone i got my earbuds in it's the closest thing to in-person in-office analysis patient sees me for two seconds on the way into the house two seconds on the way out of the house the rest of the time i'm sitting over there the patient's lying here we're not looking at each other we're going into reverie now I don't know to what extent that connects with mindfulness meditation or not, but to me, this going into reverie is like going into dreams, going into a dreamy state. It's going into a daydreamy state. Um, and that is essential to help the unconscious become conscious. So it's to me, it's deeper than mindfulness. That's why I say heartfulness. You know, we're we're trying to we're trying to rediscover buried emotions. Soul making is about emotions. You know, I mean, you've been splitting off your anger all your life, and in your analysis, you're starting to get a dim idea. Gee, it looks like I might be angry. Ah, oh, I see. I'm ang I'm getting angry. My God, I'm full of rage. My God, I want to murder people. I didn't know. 
that this was me. Um, uh, important not to act it out, but you got to know about it. You got to know about your lust. You got to know about your rage. Um, and the more you know about them, the more you're able to sublimate and contain and modulate and, and, and moderate these things. When they're split off, they begin to have a life of their own and they can take you over. I mean, I guess that's what demons are. Uh, we manufacture demons by repressing our unwanted emotions. Demonic hate, demonic lust. It starts to control us because we haven't made it conscious. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, so you mentioned this sort of, uh, re, re, I'm not, I don't think the right word was regression, but uh, to, to sort of allowing the mind to sink into deeper layers and then that's what reverie reverie is reverie, the word yeah. Of, yeah reverie which is comes from the french rev which means dream right you know uh, I, there was an analyst uh bertram lewin who talked about how um we gave up the early psychoanalysts gave up hypnosis but we we continue to have some hangover from the hypnotic we put them on a couch they're lying down we don't put them to sleep but we put them we like them to get a little sleepy the room is not brightly lit um and psychoanalytic technique as lewin says is we put them a little to sleep uh, we wake them a little up we won't we don't want them to be too sleepy because that's a little bit like psychosis uh, they're starting to take their dreams literally. Um, uh, they're moving into that concrete paranoid schizoid area, which that's to wake up, wake up a little, wake up a little. Uh, but then you get the intellectuals, the professors who come to psychoanalysis. My God, would you please go to sleep a little? <laughs> you know, they're all up in their heads. Um, and we want them to come much closer to their emotions. The way I sometimes put it, some patients come wrapped too tight. We want them to loosen up. Some patients come wrapped too loose. And we don't want them to unravel any further. They're already unraveled enough. Let's help them kind of get a little more organized, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny that you mentioned uh, lust and hatred. Because uh, basically also through studying your work, I stumbled into buddhism a bit mm -hmm. there the three poisons of the mind are uh greed hatred and delusion right uh and the four noble truths are basically recognizing suffering and then it arising due to craving but you could say super ego right. and then recognizing a path out of it which is the uh, ultimately mindfulness but the mindfulness rests upon the first right effort which is this cultivating the hard qualities and before that the ethics and before that the wisdom uh, right you find all of that in buddhism you see i've always had i studied a lot of buddhism for uh, earlier in my life i read a lot um, um but there's but i'm so thoroughly christian like there's something that leaves me a little cold about buddhism um i know the bodhisattva returns but it, it doesn't i don't know uh, you know jesus is so thoroughly immersed in the ethical um i don't know what is it about buddhism it, it, there's, i feel there's a certain coldness to it i'm probably not being fair to the tradition um in this paper on spirituality at one point i'm talking about how um psychoanalysts you know in the 70s and 80s began to have the courage against the deeply atheistic freudians they had the courage to start addressing spiritual topics uh, 
the Catholic um, William Meisner wrote a book on psychoanalysis and religion. Um, Winnicott was more friendly. Um, um, at Yale, Stanley Levy, I mean, he, he had to retire first. Then he admitted he was a lifelong Anglo-Catholic. Um, but then I also included the Buddhists because at the same time, psychoanalysts started talking about Buddhism. So they started talking about different forms of spirituality, but um, um, uh, Safran edited a wonderful book on psychoanalysis and, and, and Buddhism. Um, Epstein, Thoughts Without a Thinker. Okay, these are important efforts uh, on the part of psychoanalysis to come to grips with spirituality. Um, but, and the whole mindfulness thing, it's got to be good. But to me, it, it's lacking something it, it, because I'm Christian. That's why I feel it's lacking something. <laughs> yeah. No, I actually agree. I never really did much with uh, like the mindfulness and really did more of the right effort in hindsight, which is basically the abandoning of unwholesome states. Yes. And then the cultivating of wholesome states. Yes. And then yes. when I go to like sometimes when there's mindfulness and they just have to observing and I'm like, this is too hard, man. <laughs> this is like you you if you don't have to if you don't bring the heart into this, it's gonna it's like cold and and rough terrain yes. that you're sort of getting into. Absolutely, absolutely. The heart is central. I, I, I've been reading the uh, Southern, I love these Southern Catholic writers, Southern US, Flannery O'Connor, and I recently discovered this Walker Percy, and I'm reading one of his novels. It's called Love in the Ruins, and uh, he's uh, a fallen Roman Catholic. Um, and his his nurse, he's a psychiatrist. His his nurse is uh, a, a, a Presbyterian, but he describes the difference between her uh, and him. Like she she goes to church, she's very wholesome, she um, is honest and kind, and and she she does right. But even though she goes to church, she's embarrassed by this whole God business. She doesn't believe in God. Um, she doesn't need God. And he says, well, what, what, what's the relevance of God when you're striving to be kind and good and wholesome and honest? I mean, who needs God, okay? On the other hand, he says, there's me. Uh, I'm a devout Catholic. Um, uh, I, I I believe in the Jews, in Jesus, and the whole deal, but I don't do right. And he says, between the two of us, we could have saved Christianity, but we lost it. Okay, that that's really interesting. Here's this woman who is just such a good, honest person. But she doesn't have any need for God, she feels, okay? It embarrasses her, all that God talk. She's too busy being good, okay? Meanwhile, he's got all of the God talk, but he isn't good. Well, I'm reminded of your uh, book on Huckleberry Finn and the still small voice, right. where he escapes a supposed religious family and then in this escape, he lies with his back on the canoe looking into the sky. And he has this spiritual moment where he connects to something or... So there is a kind of uh, orientation there. So yes. I wonder if the lady, even though she like... And that's also with like to what extent, if you have this label, oh, I'm an atheist. To what extent are you actually atheist or if you have this label so there's this kind of almost like uh uh the categories it's like uh almost like you you've mentioned also the via negativa some other uh work yes yes in, in sort of this abandoning effort of i'm not this i'm not that uh and and then doing that coming closer to something that is not 
Ramana Maharshi is the Indian guru who for me most embodies that via negativa. That, that's his meditation. Any self-image, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that. You're talking about how people get captured by these images uh, or these categories. I mean, I'm looking into my dining room and I'm remembering years ago, um, one of my stepsons is, is uh, well, he has since become an Orthodox Jew, but he was always a religious Jew, but he was very interested in Christianity. I thought he was going to convert, but he didn't. Uh, he went the other way and he went into Orthodoxy. But um, whatever, I'd be sitting at the table and I'd be calling my, I, I'd be calling myself an atheist and, um, and he would just be, he would just look down and, and chuckle. He would giggle. You know, he just laughed at me uh, because he could see very clearly that I'm a Christian believer. Um, but I did not have that in my self-concept at all, but he saw it. It was just in, more in the, in the way that you approached things or saw things. You're, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't found a way really intellectually yet to 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 integrate who I really am on deeper levels of the soul and of the emotions. I hadn't found a way to integrate that with my education, my highly secular rationalist education. Uh, and I, But I was always reading theology and gradually finding ways to begin to integrate it through the work of Paul Tillich, for example, uh, and Boltzmann, demythologizing, my teacher at the University of Toronto, Northrop Fry, the Bible as metaphor, all of the, and then the existentialists of Macquarie, people who were using Heidegger to interpret the New Testament in existentialist terms. That all helped me finally get to a place where I could understand myself as as Christian. Yeah, so that maybe also goes into maybe perhaps the dreams you spoke of, the deeper layers that a yes. lot of Christianity is there in a way. To, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. You mentioned the dreams at this point. In my very first analysis, I mean, I arrived at his office with my hair down to the middle of my back and I was a total hippie and I, I'd been doing a lot of LSD and my hippie girlfriend had embroidered little slices of watermelon and things on my jeans and, 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 uh, God, uh, he was, he was an ex RAF bomber pilot who survived the war and trained in psychiatry and psychoanalysis in London. He was chief of psychiatry in Toronto. Yeah, I imagine he took one look at me and thought, oh my God, what have I got here? You know, I was already a tenured professor. Um, I guess I wasn't tenured, I was a professor. I was on my way to tenure. But anyway, so I'm on his couch and early within the first, I think, few weeks of the analysis, I'm bringing him my dreams. And I had a dream in which um, a little boy, maybe three or four this is just about the time that my mother's drinking i became aware began to become aware of my mother's drinking he's a sad little boy and he's sitting in uh, on the sidewalk on the curb in front of his house the house was behind me and i'm on the curb like my feet are on the road and i'm sitting on the sidewalk very sad um and somehow then the words associated with that came agnus dei the the lamb of god and the lamb is sacrificed the lamb is so clearly i'm feeling like i'm being sacrificed and hurt and killed by what's going on with my mother and my family and uh, but but of course you know i'd been an atheist for years but now i'm having a dream in which the word agnus dei is central to the dream and um 
I remembered what that meant. I knew what that meant. I knew that this dream was a Christian dream of some sort. Um, so already the soul was starting to send me messages, you know? Yeah, that's interesting that at that time, and uh, I think this is also uh, uh, the part about your mother, I've the first time that I've uh, heard this. So. Uh, uh i know that you at one point also reflected on why you went with melanie klein or, uh, yes uh so so i I'm needed money to, i'm wondering how this ties in and and i'm sorry that this happened to you uh you know uh but uh i'm wondering what sort of role did this play throughout your career and then right well tremendous uh i chose the mother of psychoanalysis over the father uh, i mean i agree i'm grounded in freud and he was a genius he was wrong about a number of important things but he was right about a number of very important things so he's the foundation but um and there wasn't any exposure to melanie klein in the toronto institute we were freudian ego psychology uh, montreal was heavily kleinian because the canadian clifford scott uh, went to England and lived there and was part of the Klein circle. And he became um, the president of the British Psychoanalytic, which is interesting because when Canada tried to organize a psychoanalytic society, the Americans tried to block us. They wanted us to be an affiliate of the Detroit society. And they tried to block us from being an independent. But anyway, um, Clifford, Canadian, was now president of the British. And he and Anna Freud got together and they said no, no to the Americans. Uh, they made us an independent Canadian society. And uh, the Americans were so angry, they threatened to withdraw from the IPA if, if, if the Canadians became a separate society, you know? Um, they didn't, they dropped it, they backed off. Uh, but anyway, Clifford Scott, uh, when he was through his presidency of the British, he returned to Canada. He was originally from the Toronto area, but he settled, settled in Montreal. And for decades, he trained child analysts in Kleinian and adult analysts in Kleinian theory. So Montreal had a huge Kleinian presence. In Toronto, we didn't have that at all. But I, after I graduated as an analyst, I, I went through various schools of thought and I wound up really being very influenced by the Kleinian, um, the Kleinian tradition. Uh, but yeah, I chose the mother um, uh, because I realized things had gone wrong in my life both edipally and pre edipally but fundamentally pre edipally I mean, I still, I think, I think my mother did a decent job pre edipally but age four, you're moving into the Oedipus complex. I, I had damage both pre edipally and certainly edipally. Um, but you see, I, I not only chose Melanie Klein and, and became quite concerned with the, the early mother infant relationship and all of that but on the oedipal level <laughs> my present wife they did a documentary here on me a colleague of mine who, he wanted to analyze he wanted to make a film about his analyst but of course his analyst would not allow this but he found another analyst me who, who i allowed him to do this one hour documentary on me and he did a lot of research. He went into my childhood. Uh, he, he got pictures from family photographs. He filmed like the church where I had attended and the school that I attended and all of that. And I was interviewed, you know. And um, at, towards the end of the interview, the interviewer, a woman was talking to me about my mother and uh, my current wife. And um, he put up on the screen a picture of my mother in her late 30s or early 40s. And on the other side of the screen, he put a picture of my present wife. They were both blonde and curvy. And he overlapped the pictures. It's like the same woman. Uh, and a colleague of his phoned him the next day and said, to the producer, how did you get that guy to go on TV and admit he's a motherfucker? 
Okay. I'm not literally a motherfucker, but I get to go to bed with a woman who is the spitting image of my mother. <laughs> That's allowed, you see. It's not incestuous, but in my mind, it's incestuous enough to be very exciting and very fulfilling. I got the mother. I lost her to alcohol. I finally got her back. You know, but it's not literally her. Um, so I, I, I guess that's also partly why I like Anglo-Catholicism. There is a Mary altar. Um, uh, the Hail Mary is said at the end of services. Um, so, yeah, there is devotion to Mary in the Anglo-Catholic tradition. Um, a female presence it's not all this patriarchal father son stuff you know yeah and then you uh, go to this place uh and you have this dream agnes day and that's maybe one of uh first moments uh where this is coming back to you the christianity or yeah, I, I guess that must have been one of the first moments. My, my, my father was still alive then. Um, so then there's that moment in the hospital. He was in a coma. He fell out of bed and broke a hip. So they took him. If they'd taken him to the heart hospital, there was a do not resuscitate order. But they took him to the bone hospital. And while waiting to have his hip attended to, he had his fourth heart attack. And they they revived him, which put him in a coma. And it took like almost a month for him to die. And I'm sitting beside his bed uh, as he's dying. And he it was April and, and the hospital was overheating. We throw off the covers and his thin his skin was very thin. You could see the rib cage, and then you would look look up at the crucifix and uh, felt to me I like I finally understood what the crucifix was about um jesus went to his death my father is going to his death soon it'll be my turn then it'll be my son's turn um that had a big impact on me and remember i had been reading theology for years but not connecting to it heartfully but it was almost as if everything was ready <laughs> on the intellectual level everything was ready uh, and then finally the heart came and uh and it was quite a conversion uh i i was quite passionate i found myself a retired anglo-catholic priest who gave me spiritual direction for about a year and i was attending church regularly i was uh helping the priest administer the eucharist i was a chalice bearer and uh, i was really into it um it all calmed down gradually Nowadays, I actually don't enter the church more than about twice a year. Christmas, Easter, I go actually go to church. But I, I kind of hold my own services. And, uh, oh, uh, my wife got tickets for the uh, Christmas concert at the Philadelphia Orchestra. I was delighted, but I said, well, is there a Messiah? She didn't think there was... Well, there is a Messiah. December 22nd, she got tickets for the Messiah. Now, to me, even in the days of my atheism, I always went to the Messiah every Christmas season, and I would be weeping. I, I can't sit through Messiah without crying, um, even when I thought of myself as an atheist. Um, uh, it's a very emotional experience for me. There's something very special about that particular piece of music, and uh, it's just very powerful. So, yeah, it came back in bits and pieces. And you chose, uh, you also mentioned the Virgin Mary, so the, the mother figure was also Central. there. Yeah. Central, yes yeah yeah that's uh, uh yeah. in the eastern orthodox church too um i have icons um 
uh, I have icons all around and uh, the Vladimir uh, icon of the Virgin Mary is very important to me. What, yeah, that I is, think, sorry? Is that, is, that, is that a specific type of icon? It's, uh, let me see if I have, hold on. Yeah. Um, Can you see all three? Uh, I, I'll not the above one. Uh, now, I, yeah, the above one and the uh, Jesus one. is above, and the Last Supper is in the middle, and the Vladimir icon of the Virgin Mary with child is at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've lined them up so that they form a cross on the wall, but it's tucked away in a corner. <laughs> I think most patients who come here don't notice it. Okay. Yeah, that's very uh, <laughs> spirituality tucked in a corner. In a corner, because, you know, there are many Jewish patients and atheist patients, and it's not my job to try to convert anyone to Christianity, but uh, I, I do feel, I mean, that's one corner on, on one side of the room. Here is uh, here is pictures of Melanie Klein, Sigmund Freud, and down at the bottom, Jean-Paul Sartre, another Melanie Klein. <laughs> so the, yeah. and the patients maybe start out sitting over there, so they're they're exposed to to that. But above the fireplace is that's. Um, that's Rome, uh, an etching of, of, and at the center is the Vatican. Um, but, you know, and there's a lot of Christian stuff here and here, another icon back there. But then there are Persian things. That's a Persian miniature. That's a Persian miniature. So I'm not beating people over the head with the imagery in the consulting room. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, very, very neat to see the inside of the of Car Carvef's uh, room. I think uh, so. It's so a many very people. Cozy room. I mean, I also have a fireplace, a gas fireplace there. Ah, okay. Uh, and in these cold Canadian winters, uh, it's a it's a fairly um, nice, warm, cozy room for people to lie down and do the analysis here. Cozy yeah. for me too. Yeah, no, I I think many people have been in your online room. You, I think you could say, uh, right, uh, the same the wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, because my back is to. I'm looking at the computer at the other end of the house, and all of this is in the background. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that has also been some kind of uh, because you really interweave the sociological with the psychological, and then by doing this kind of uh, analysis, broadbending it, you're also I think it's changing the social as well in a in a way that is ultimately uprooting the hatred and the loss and replacing it. So uh, oh, that's a thought. That's a very nice thought. Thank you for that. I've never, I don't much usually think of it that way, but I see your point. Mm -hmm. That's uh, like if you're, I mean, I myself was a bit of a convert, I think, when I discovered your videos in the sense of, uh, oh, wow, I thought I was an atheist, but uh then i became like a christian atheist like saying no to anger and uh i myself also had a lot of uh anger at that time so uh it really was uh so insightful and helpful uh oh, that's great so uh yeah and and reading some comments on your a lot of your videos i think there's a lot of people like this so i think uh yeah it's basically sharing a lot of wisdom and then a call to change ethics and then 
that leading to wholesome states of mind uh, for right right yeah i'm thinking right now uh, about how long it took me to forgive my mother um because i couldn't stand the tension of loving her and hating her so i simplified life by splitting and hating her but she had she had to be dead she had to be in the ground for about 10 years before i began to recover memories of her sweetness which i had been in denial of and i began to remember her teaching me how to swim i remember going fishing with her at the summer cottage i remember playing card games with her uh, when she was not drinking she was a, a, a lively friendly everyone loved her she was the spirit of the party you know and uh when i was ill as a child i i was in hospital uh pretty much the th between three and four i was in the hospital with a strange disease which uh, they couldn't figure out what it was high spiking aching joints it wasn't rheumatoid arthritis uh, sort of well i think no no it wasn't rheumatic fever but it was rheumatoid arthritis it might have been stills disease which might have been um an immune system thing and i think it's too complicated to go into here but she was very good um but she was overwhelmed and she struggled with depression and she took to drinking but but i began lately even recently last few months i'm having more and more memories of her sweet side and i'm 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 not i'm i'm not just forgiving her it's i'm feeling very very guilty and i'm trying to make reparation to her for all of those years of hatred which was destroying my soul uh, i would do anything to be able to have her back and to apologize to her and tell her that i still love her that i always loved her but it was too painful to love her so i had to hate her you know god here i am 80 and uh and only now at this late date well this process has been happening for many years now gradually remembering and forgiving and so on but boy the anger was very intense for a long time and it really it blinded me and it it harmed me you know yeah yeah maybe on the rational side it might not be so uh possible but uh on the other side i mean do you think that it, it, it does matter to uh to do this to forgive oh i think it matters i uh, i don't know whether it matters to her she's gone but it matters to me um you know you can't look if you walk around hating your mother you are going to be hateful towards women your mother is the first woman um um as i become more loving and forgiving of my mother I become nicer to my wife. <laughs> uh, well, I become nicer to people in general um, because love is replacing hate in, in my heart. And uh, um, so, yeah, it's taken me, uh, it, the healing has come very slowly. Uh, on different levels you know different levels doesn't happen all at once you know i guess it starts in the more cerebral the more intellectual and, and then it gets deeper and then it gets deeper um it's pretty deep right now my wish to be able to apologize to my mother uh, look i had good reasons for hating her she was awful uh, when she was drinking she really 
kind of blighted much of my childhood with her drinking. I'm not saying that my anger was not justified anger, but that's the thing. Even justified anger has to be let go. Oh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard that I say unto you, you have heard that, you know, you shouldn't commit murder. But I say that if you go to bed at night with hatred in your heart of your brother, you, you you're sinning. Um, you not only not you not only must not murder, but you got to let go of anger, even justified anger. I'm thinking of that novel they made a great film of Sophie's Choice, and the Nazis. She's Jewish, and she's being herded with her two kids into a box car, and a sadistic Gestapo guy says. Um, I'm going to kill one of your children. You must choose. If you don't, I'll kill them both. She has to choose Sophie's choice. So she chooses. And of course, her life is ruined. How can she live with that? And, how, and, and, and now her heart is absolutely not only full of guilt, but full of hatred towards the monster who, who made her do that. But from a psychoanalytic point of view, she has to let go of, certainly of the guilt, but she has to let go of the hate. He was a monster. Why should you forgive him? Huh. He doesn't deserve it, but you have to forgive him for yourself. It's, if, you don't, if you don't, you're going to be sick for the rest of your life with your, because the hate makes you sick. Now. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very powerful uh, emotion. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for all these uh, insights and words. Uh, again, it's been really, uh, I think six years ago that I first discovered you. And mm -hmm. uh, last year you were also at the National Conference for Dutch Chaplains. Yes, we had a good time. That was a good event. Yeah, so uh, I think really this uh, post-secular, I think, it's a thing that is perhaps growing so it's going to be really interesting to see if thoughts like this can get integrated and what that would look like uh of course the society is now well some say you could say it's not heading in a good direction yeah <laughs> uh, war everywhere yeah so maybe how do you look down uh on that uh particularly i think Looking back, you mentioned the uh, hippie time. I think uh, I myself and my generation really look at that as, wow, what was uh, possible then and, and all this peace and, and et cetera. And now we're here. So it's kind of a. Oh, it's very dark. It's very dark. And politically, we have Trump again. Uh, the election is in a couple of weeks and the country is knife edge divided i mean and if he gets into the presidency american democracy i think is doomed uh, but uh so these are very scary times uh, last night at about 11 p.m or something i got an email from i work with some uh, psychoanalysts and therapists in iran in tehran and i get an email from this woman in Tehran, and she says she's very frightened. She thinks the Israeli assault has started. She hears sirens and she hears explosions. I haven't heard from her today. I hope she's okay. I think they were mainly targeting military uh, facilities. Uh, I haven't heard. I'm going to check the news now. Uh, look, it's a scary world right now. The chances of nuclear war are are, are very high. Um, what can we do? Uh, I guess we can pray, and we can reach out to one another and try to comfort one another. Try to keep hope alive. Uh, I guess I have hope, but that's fine. It's very easy for me to have hope sitting 
here in high ground in Toronto, um, I'm not going to get swamped by the rise of the ocean or the Great Lakes. I'm up here on top of a hill in Toronto. Uh, but, you know, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes, um, climate change. I'm very worried about my son. He's only 34, going on 35. He will see some awful things. Um, but people still have hope that we will get through this. Um, it's not going to wipe humanity off the planet, I don't believe. Um, so we have to have ways of sustaining hope, which means also being able to get on with our lives. And in spite of all of the suffering around us, we have to we have to be able to get on with our lives and find meaning in them. You know, by doing what we can. I, I feel blessed to be a psychoanalyst. I, I'm able to help people and I'm able to see them getting help. Not every case, some cases are very hard and you don't see a lot of progress. Um, but other cases you see people turning around and you see them getting better. And, and I know I've played a part in that. And um, that that makes life very meaningful and sustains hope yeah yeah that's a very uh yeah good message uh i guess uh yeah it's really wild seeing what's happening uh the just yeah it's it's a bit befuddling <laughs> yeah for sure for sure dark times yeah uh then i want to thank you for this uh interview most welcome and uh, yeah, uh, have a good uh, have a good day. You too. Lovely to talk to you. Be well. Bye now.